Hi, everybody. Oh, is it on? Can you guys hear okay? Yeah. I mean, I can project into this <laughs> room, I think. <laughs> Sharif, right? I said it correctly. <laughs> um, let's do it the formal way at first. Sharif Shanahan is here with us today, the author of two books of poetry, one of which we are particularly celebrating, Trace Evidence, which was published this year by Tin House and recently longlisted for the National Book Award in Poetry. Right. So uh, is your, your first book, the one I got to know uh, you by was Into Each Room We Enter Without Knowing which won the first book award in the Crab Orchard series in poetry and was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry and the Publishing Triangle's Tom Gunn Award. Um, your poems and interviews have been published pretty much everywhere in Portland. I'm just gonna list a few of these. Um, the New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Paris Review, The New Republic, PBS NewsHour. All right, so that's more than a few. I also want to mention, um, among other anthologies, the really great anthology, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, edited by Kevin Young, out from Library of America in 2020. All right, so that's the impressive formal stuff out of the way. But I have a few things to say about Sharif's work too, and especially this last book, which you all should purchase a copy of if you don't have it already. Um, by the way, Ocean Wong called it magical. <laughs> Correct. Right? There is something otherworldly about Sharif's ability to bring gnomic or proverbial forms of wisdom into contact with narrative so fluently through choosing words precisely, altering expected syntax precisely, of course, juxtaposition, easy to see, but breaking lines of flow like the most natural language engineer possible. And what happens through these sonic and grammatical interventions into narrative in almost every poem, I think, is an entirely new experience. And so I don't mean these poems are conveying an experience we can share in some world that Sharif is confessing to us. And um, I can understand why in at least one of your interviews, Sharif, you sort of push back against the notion of your work as confessional. Because what I mean is that I get, and we can get as readers, a new world from each of these poems. And from these books as a whole, we get multiple worlds and the sort of gentle overlap, differing or orbital vectors. And most importantly, none of these worlds are the same as the one I feel like we're sharing every day, right? All really great in poetry, all really great poetry and art does this. Right? These poems might be built partly on things that happened in this shared world that we're in, but the poetry pushes us out into other possible worlds. So grief, struggle with belonging, struggle with stability, those are the frequent moods of these poems, but that makes them liberatory in a non-facile way. So thank you for writing about queerness, mixed raceness, internalized racism the challenge of the multiple selves that we inhabit, evade, create. But most of all, I thank you for writing about all of these things in that very difficult and liberatory way of pushing language into world making. And so, <laughs> please welcome Sharif Shanahan. Just a touch sure, more. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that really moving uh introduction. I'm very moved. I'm a deeply feeling large hearted person, and it doesn't take a lot. <laughs> Uh, to move me, but that was really special after a flurry of six Uber cancellations. From... So I was frantically arriving at the at the shop and then I needed air and then I sat down and didn't really know where I was and then I was moved. Um, uh, 
Thank you for that. Thank you for stepping in. Thank you for that kindness and the thoughtful attention to my work. Thank you um, for being here, all of you. Um, I'm really honored and happy to have the opportunity to share some of these poems. And I think I'm just going to let the work speak for itself after that really sensitive introduction. And I'll try to read from each of the three sections of the book so you can get a sense of the arc. Mulatto quadroon somewhere between. I want to tell you what for me it has been like. To speak at all, I must occupy a position in a system whose positions I appear not to occupy. Though some say such non-position is my position, speak from that placeless place outside the system, etc., some would say and have said. If the placeless place is created by terms of the system, then it must be within the system, even if it appears otherwise. And so it may be that the position presumed to be of body might better be regarded as a position of thought or a receptivity to possible experience as conceived by the still implausible eye of a man who defined the flimsy self he carried against those whom he did not understand or know or in any real sense see. And if the possible vision of that implausible eye accounted for you in name only, then filed you under consequence, side effect, it is not that the system fails to position you, it positions you actively and specifically nowhere so that you appear on the outside but remain within, or you appear within but remain on the outside, which is to say, in other words, a part and a part. And so if to speak in a particular social world, I must occupy a position and that world consists of positions that are clear, but none of which clearly I occupy, then it may be that I cannot, even if I want to, tell you what for me it has been like. And so. How's everybody doing? How are your days? How are your weeks? How are your lives? How are you feeling? Yeah, it's a hard time. It's a hard week. Um, I'm happy to hold this space with you. Colonialism. At intersections, I knew to look both ways, as she had taught me, as she had known to look both ways at the port of arrival not to Ellis Island or to JFK, but to the white blanket of my father, then back to her mother, then away. So that when the single summer we returned to the land she had left, and the four of us, she, myself, my two tanned brothers, stood below the open Casablanca sun, waiting on a thinly grassed divider for a sliver to open up within the traffic. The air smart and nearly visible as neighbor boys pointed down from windows, Maricani, Maricani. And I dashed through the exhaust of four lanes, not exactly a highway, but still too wide to be crossing and without a crosswalk, no less. She rushed to the other side and slapped my backside hard. Elesh, mon fille, why? Would you do that to me? Control. In the Pornhub video, two houseless men suck each other on a subway bench. It's late at night, but not late enough no one is around. The people are outraged call the men disgusting, New York and humans disgusting. 
while they continue to record. I have the space inside my body to feel the two men, their commitment to pleasure absent basic comfort. The one's face nearly neutral as though his friend's mouth and the sting of existence canceled each other out almost like a mannequin, just there. On High Street yesterday morning, walking briskly in no clear direction, I saw a man on the opposite sidewalk, a motorcycle parked at a right angle to his feet. He put one hand on a handle, the other on his crotch, and glared above the slow moving traffic at me. The question in his face, its own answer. When I tell you I don't know what to do with my life, I mean I don't know how to stay inside it. Joy, Gary says, is a feeling of profound gratitude. And before I can ask for what, for having come how far I have come, I celebrate my friend and think at once, we should be grateful then for surviving a country that makes of survival a victory and not a right. We talk about our boyfriends, Syntax, Nella Larson's passing. Gary leans across the couch to touch my chin. We were lovers once, briefly. I look at him, look at me. Try to love yourself, darling, he says. You're going to be here a long time. I can snap if you want. <laughs> I mean, no pressure. Don't do it if you don't want to, but feel feel free. Um, feel free. It's so intimate. I kind of feel like I want to just take a seat, actually. Would that be awkward for you all? I think I'd like to do that, actually. Thanks. Yeah, I think so. And then we could see each other eye to eye. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll just do a couple more from the first section and then I'll tell you about the long poem in the middle of the book. This is called Exile. It happened inside a single room for me. Forgive me if you feel with this assertion, I diminish you or the integrity of your story. But it's true. I was nowhere there, on the frayed bound carpet between two beds, mine to the right, my brother's to the left, counting the tiny holes in the radiator cover, dark eyes piercing through painted white metal. When I looked around, I saw nothing that I was, not even other nothings like me. Do you think I take from you? I do not take from you. I am you. This is called My People. I have longed to say my people, not because I was born of two peoples, of blue tiled walls and strip malls, not because I don't know where I belong or with whom or worse, who I am as onlookers have in their pity proclaimed, the lovers too after they've exited my body which they felt emboldened to name. I have longed to say my people and to be clear to all people, to any you imagined by the mind of an embodied you that was also first imagined. I am interested in repair without shame. I am interested in restitution with anger. I am interested in anger as love, in having anyone who hears the phrase see it vanish into the edge of what they know, to know how far I mean it to reach. My people as redundancy, as symbol of the first truth, immutable, almost banal in its assertion. If you are on this earth, you are of this earth. Okay, so in the fall of 
2015, I left my job and my apartment in New York um, for a Fulbright in Morocco. And one line of my people are uh, from, from Morocco and I was going to do genealogical research and to research representations of blackness in literature and visual art in the Maghreb, specifically in Morocco. And two months into my time in Morocco, I was on an overnight bus that crashed and I was badly hurt. And it took a while for the doctors to figure out that I was in danger. And I was medevac to Zurich, Switzerland, where I had lived with my ex-partner who's Swiss. And it was a huge ordeal. And I ended up in my childhood bedroom in the Bronx uh, for a very long convalescence before moving to California. And, you know, with the distance of many years now, I can laugh at how cosmically complicated and rich it, it is and was that experience to think that you're going to your ancestral homeland and to end up home, you know, in a very, in a very different way. And so naturally, I turned to language, not poetry, really, but language to process what the hell was happening to me throughout it. You know, there were multiple surgeries. It was two months in the hospital. It was really quite an ordeal. And I wasn't going to do anything with the seven notebooks that I filled during that time. And eventually, I put this together. And so how do we feel about a long poem? Do we have... We can receive it. We're, we're okay. Good. All right. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so it takes me about twelve minutes to read, just to give you a sense. Okay. Um, and it's called "On the Overnight from Agadir." And y'all don't mind that I'm sitting down, right? Sorry. Right? Okay. Great. On the overnight from Agadir, and there's an epigraph from Darwish: "Your cause and your life are one." Don't go to discover your roots, Ladybug says. If you want to look for roots, go and look at a tree. Another day at a cafe, avoiding, pretending. Why did you come here? Tell me why. If you want to die, go ahead and die. Do it quickly. If you want to be dead, you can be dead. But the days are long and always the same. But the nights are long and always the same. I feel that time has me in a way. Do you know? A tree. But do you see its roots when you look at a tree? The syringa from the cover of that playbill in high school haunted me for weeks. It's net of empty branches. See, that's the problem, that right there. How the mind moves from the one thing that's here and suddenly I am 55, though it's still two o'clock on Tuesday. Two o'clock on Tuesday happens in Morocco, too. My mother says we are European, and I shake my head at her desperate face. My mother says we speak French in Morocco, and I shake my head. Morgan says maybe it could be good for you to travel to the motherland. It's necessary trauma for each of us. I call my ex-partner in Brussels, with whom I lived in seven cities on three continents, and say, Habibi, I think I just want my own apartment and a dog, and to stop working like a mule. And we laugh. Morgan says, you have to go. Why do I sense that I cannot trust what I feel in my chest? Are there even trees in North Africa? If you don't want to live, you don't want to live anywhere. Avoiding what? The I'm sorry, but there's no other way to say it. Meaninglessness. So that is why you get on a plane and go to the third world for a year. I don't know. Clearly, I don't know. And the third world as a phrase is so did the colonizer kill or make thrive? Did the colonizer kill or make thrive? Honestly, who cares? I don't need history to justify me. I just want a dog. I wouldn't mind having a Moroccan lover, I tell my shrink out of things to say. 
Perhaps taking a Moroccan lover, ideally a Black one, will help you feel connected to yourself in a new way and rejuvenate your enthusiasm for living, your sense of purpose. I fire my shrink on the spot. Call the second one as I'm leaving the office and fire her too. On the street, a Frenchie shits on the curb, her owner on his phone looking the other way. I know exactly who I am. It's that there is no point. And then we, I'm telling you, just go and look at a tree. Then in the early morning hours on a bus almost returned to Rabat, a razor of light slits my eye down the center. Suddenly the bus on its side, dirt in the air, stars in the dirt. In one skull, an eye looks west, another east. Into a net of glass, a girl's face is pressed. A hand cuts the smoke inside the bus. He stepped over a woman in his Ami's age, hijab beside her, blonde hair exposed, her arms and legs splayed into a geometric shape. He threw himself from the bus's side, a tingling from his shoulder to his thumb. A green eye, a brown eye in the same skull. A woman inside a bush, a child and a man merged at the waist. Two heads, two torsos, no feet. On the side of the road, weeds, a cough, another, no horns, a light, some trees. Inside the darkness, my eyes make a dark, all outline. It hangs heavy over me, its empty face locked on my emptied face, holding us in mutual study. Then a slow lifting and I breathe awake. Awake in the hospital bed, my phone rings. Ladybug, you thought you were going to Morocco, she says, laughing. You were going to the body. I know the doctor says he's fine, but he cannot feel his hand. I know, but the doctor says he's fine. The doctor says he'll be back to his old self in no time. What language were you speaking? Did you reach his parents? Yes, he doesn't want them to come. Has the mother been informed of her blackness or that of her children? Stop. The boy's neck. Has the mother been informed of the neck? Dear one, I was trying to enter my own life. I felt outside my own life. I was looking, trying to find a door to quiet the mind I knew I was more than. I wanted to control only what I could control. I wanted nothing grand, epithetic, oracular. On the contrary, I wanted to be small, to disturb and be disturbed the absolute least. Silly, naive. The clock kept telling me my birthday, 1227. Every day for a year, I saw it twice. You were waiting to live. It happens to the best of us. The within is within wherever you take it. When did you break the neck? Three years ago now? What stillness did you seek? Whatever you're looking for is not here. What does he look for? Who does he look to be? If he wants to be dead, he can be dead. Dear one, I thought the clock was telling me to start over that I could start over any time. I mean, two births a day. As the bus tilted onto its side and crashed, I saw all I would not become. A thin book turned into a face, the face turned into four. My work, I exclaimed inwardly to no one in particular as we hit the gravel. I have not done my work. Mo brings me coffee in the snow to the Upper West Side all the way from Brooklyn and says, baby, you weren't supposed to be there. You weren't supposed to be there and the ancestors saved you. A wooden bowl of unripe persimmons on my friend's coffee table, a ceramic ball of yogurt with raw honey. V says, see, if that accident had happened to me, my mother would have been on the first plane out of Vancouver to be by my side. 
Morgan meets me for brunch so I can start getting back into the world. Still in a neck brace, I look into her compassion. We both struggle. I phone my old shrink from college and say, can you believe this shit? I almost can't. And we laugh. Mo says, you weren't supposed to be there, baby. And we post pics on Facebook to make our friends smile. Look, you did not listen to yourself. You did not want to go, by which I mean the child inside you, and I don't care how that sounds. I hit reply to the email, then X out of the draft. I hit reply again, then go down the hall for tea. I mean, the injury took you back to Zurich, where you had tried to love a man into being your father. Then, in, then to your childhood bedroom in the Bronx, you can't make that shit up. I carry my tea back to the desk. It goes cold before I take a sip. Dear one, another bed flat on my back again. Returned to the waiting. I am waiting for the neck to heal, to live. What generates this sensation that life is elsewhere or happening in the future? That it will begin once the neck has healed and I arrive in California, where it will begin once I am worthy of living, or once I feel comfortable more often than I do not, or once I can provide for myself in a two-bedroom apartment, where it will begin once I no longer look outside myself for an answer, or once I no longer feel drawn to Morocco, to our pain, or once, where does the self hide when it hides? Where was I? if I didn't know why I was there. Where does the inquiry begin? Does it begin in my particular body, in my particular mind? Does it begin centuries before me? Does it begin in my mother? Does it begin in all these places at once, once the market tries to close? Once the mother gives her son a face he can use? It's not the skin so much as it is the shape of the bones beneath it, the way they form a gestalt. Once the father says, come back, my boy, I see you. I want you to know that I see you. Listen, I have mulled this over ad nauseum. All obvious interpretations are trite, lacking, uncompelling, that my home is not there, that I needed to leave, that I had to care better for my body, that my body did not belong to me, Nothing is ordered. Everything is random. Nothing is random. Everything is ordered. If you will not use your voice to speak, your voice will be taken. It's not your work, silly boy. If you will not do it, your gifts will be passed to another. Thank you for driving slowly, I say from the back seat. When I was last here three years ago now, I was badly hurt. The road lines, vacant lots of dust, hot air cycling through the open windows. Yes, they told me at the Riyadh, he says. I'd like to show you something. He pulls down the neck of his t-shirt, a scar from his hairline down the length of his spine. I exit my body, then return so forcefully I shift in my seat. Eighteen years prior, two thieves in his taxi, he explains, a struggle, the car splayed by a tree, a broken neck, two months in hospital, the scar. And so I think Allah sent me to you. What road is this? I ask. He turns, hands steady on the wheel. The A3. It runs north to south, from Kaza to Agadir. Thanks, so How's everybody doing? <laughs> How are you? How's it going? You're all right. You're all here. Good. So I think I'll just do a few more from the third section, and then we can talk. How does that sound? Sound good? All right. This is called While I Wash My Face, I Ask Impossible Questions of Myself and Those Who Love Me. Specks of toothpaste fleck the mirror. A fan spins dust in the hall. I find this is it, too vulgar to accept. So I wait for a new starting point as though life will begin there and then. Do you know what I mean? Not what I'm saying, 
what I mean. Is it possible my function is to hold all the intricate interstitial pain and articulate clarity? Tie a boat to my wrist, I sprout wings. Give me a pair of shoes, I grow fins. Once an hour, I trick myself into focus. I look into the glass as I look through it. When the new beginning comes, what then? Does life suddenly reset like an Atari? Does meaning emerge assertively and without invitation? The task is to live well enough with you. But how? How do you know what you want if you don't tell you, if you don't hear you? This is called psychotherapy. For all the years you have yourself submitted to this process, energetically at first, then incredulously exhausted. It may be all you needed to hear, you heard in the very first office, the one with the plastic gladiolus flanked by coiling plants on the table beneath the light switch. Abandoned is not a feeling. It's an interpretation of events. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate that. I'll just do two more and then we can talk. This is called present moment. All day, I think about what to do with the day. I walk down the street for a coffee and to think about what to do after that. On the table, someone before me has left a little saucer of salt with a wooden spoon like a tiny oar in white sand. In time, I walk back to my apartment. When I turn the key in the front gate at the bottom of the steep staircase leading up to our door, my left eyelid twitches twice. Inside, I know there are things I want to do with Monday. They levitate in the field of view my mind makes, opening like fireflies or those old yellow lanterns along the perimeter of a yard. My mother calls from New York. Tomorrow is the last day of Ramadan, and I should be sure to call her to say Eid Mubarak, which I will forget to do for at least two days. I hang up and scroll through my camera roll. One distant lover, then a second, then a third, then a shadow passes over the window. San Francisco gray on the back side of my building where the windows face, though on the front side, moments earlier, the sun touched everything enough to heat it a little to burn it a little, an oar. My roommate's dog licks my ankle and I dress for the gym, though I have no interest in staring at a wall for 45 minutes while running suspended in the air beside all the gays I never could connect with despite my love of sex. I leave my apartment and go to the mall. I buy two dress shirts and a pair of slacks, then leave, then go back in to buy a pair of gym shorts. In the bathroom, I know men who have shame or like a rush or both hawk the stalls looking for trade or stand at a urinal waiting for something to happen, for someone to come take them away from themselves. I ride the escalator up and down. Am I really 35? What time is it? Thanks, y'all. So I'll just close with this one, which is a little different. It's called Self-Portrait as Homo Sapiens. The idea of integration, the illusion of separateness, the denial of oneness, the statement of feeling, the illusion of speech, the language of illusion, the discernment of being, the statement 
of denial, the illusion of idea, the being of speech, the oneness of denial, the separateness of language, the integration of integration. Thank you so much for listening. I guess we're going to have a, a conversation now uh, between um, between Jennifer and Sharif, and then we will have time for some questions as well. So I don't know if we even need this mic. I don't know that we need the mic. Yeah, yeah. We have the Zoom mic that can take it this way. Okay. Then we have all right the virtual folks. Hi, yeah. virtual folks. Hey, virtual folks. Hey, virtual right folks. Right there. folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I prepared a few questions, but I feel like if y'all have questions, you should get them ready too, because I don't know. I that feel like great. it's weird if it's just us talking. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Thank you. Reading. I was wondering how you it, I haven't actually heard you read before. So oh. I was wondering how would all the different voices sound? Mm -hmm. And it was pretty interesting because I could still hear most of them, but mm. I you didn't emphasize the difference as much as I do in my head when mm. I'm reading. So, and you'll understand what that means when you look at the book, if you haven't already. I guess my first question is sort of related to that. Mm -hmm. Self-evasion, the theme of sort of confronting your quest for the self and critiquing that quest and playing with it, I think, you know, in some of the poems, you seem to come to the conclusion where you just sort of are saying, well, um, you can't use props. You can't use a country as a prop. You can't mm -hmm. use a tree as a prop, right? You, I was so glad you read okay. that poem. But I wonder if for you, actually, it's almost like an Ars Poetica or a core generative thing, that it's actually something you have to keep doing. Mm -hmm. and, and that produces this or is that like the wrong way to understand the way this sort of theme is flowing because it's in your first book too very much mm -hmm. you know when I was writing the poems that became trace evidence I wasn't really thinking about the eventual second book as a companion book to the first book and it it they now seem yeah. very much a couple um and I wonder what will happen with the third which I'm I'm working on and what kind of relationship it'll have um you know, I I I think the 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 quest is something that happens, of course, off the page in one's life. You know, um, in my life, and the choice to create poems about it um, feels of a particular moment to me. You know, while at once I understand that the questions that I've engaged in in this book and in the first two, but really in in trace evidence, are the central questions of my life and around which I will orbit for the duration of this existence in this body. Right? You know, the world around me might change and grow and evolve. You know, but these are the questions, and uh, you know, I think the poems kind of perform the impossibility of that quest simultaneous with the necessity of it you know um the evaded self the buried self the suppressed self the non-self how whatever however we want to language it you know we we need it in order to interface with one another right like we can understand that the terms of the social world are constructed and therefore unstable you know they hold they mostly hold which mm -hmm. is you know how it all is operative you know but it it they don't all they don't always right and what do you do in the absence of categorical position mm. that is legible to the people around you you know or uh, legible state exactly right because you walk into one room and you're perceived in this way and you walk into another room and you're perceived in this way or the privilege that you possess in one room is the very reason why you don't have privilege in the next and right so how do you 
how do you integrate all of that and really live with a sense of uh, stability within uh, is a is a question that I continue to look at, you know. Um, but we we need we need uh, some some kind of self, um, you know. And and what I in order of course we do in order to to interface and connect, you know. And what I have found in my own life is that the the terms of definition for uh, how I conceive of my own self and how I move through the world. You know, there are categorical labels that I inhabit and possess, but really it's more of a value-based identification for me that allows it to hold regardless of the room, right? Um, That's beautiful. A belief in openness and transparency and leading with vulnerability because what do I have to be ashamed of, right? Like I just... I got pushed out, <laughs> you know, it's like all of this was just here waiting for, for me, for all of us. And, you know, I think that's a shared condition and what, what isn't shared is our positionality vis-a-vis -vis the stuff that was here waiting for us. And, you know, we do what we can with it. And so, you know, that's how I think about that. I feel like maybe I'm moving away from the question a bit, but. No, I liked where your answer was. Okay, Thank great. You. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, can I switch to a totally different like facet of your like cultural production? Sure. Of, you know, the different people we are in different rooms. I am fascinated that you're also a translator okay. and how that doesn't really come up explicitly in the poems, as far as I can tell. I mean, you do use multiple languages as we all heard. Um, I don't know, maybe I was like fishing around. I was like those moments, you didn't read these, but there are a few moments where you talk about language is color. And besides the sort of racializing aspects of that sentiment mm -hmm. would be what you were just talking about. I was like, that's the kind of intuitive statement someone has when they work a lot in translation. Like mm. what is language? And you have this sort of metaphor that's kind of unexpected. Mm. I don't know, can you talk about whether or not that has anything to do with your practice? Mm -hmm. How does translation, by the way, it's, it, you mainly translate from, from Italian, Italian. Mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Um, I want to, I can't wait to check out some of the projects listed on your faculty bio. Thanks. But yeah, how does that intersect your translation practice, your poetic practice? I think it's it's really for me, it's, it's like a secondary but abiding interest that allows me, there, there's a need, thank you for asking this question because I haven't, I haven't really had to articulate the motivation behind that practice and how it relates to the kind of primary creative output, you know, but there, there's something about the, um, the position, it's like an interpersonal position. And in the context of translation, it's happening between me and the page, but it's a lived experience too, of being a receptor mm -hmm. of one's perception of me, right? Mm -hmm. That I have to receive that I have to receive the information that I am getting about what I'm giving, right? Um, in order to assess safety, yeah. right? Uh, the emotional tenor of a space, what color a room is figuratively or literally, right? Um, and there's there's something about that experience of generating based on what I've received interpersonally, being above the x-axis based on what I have received mm. um, that is like a clear analog to the translation practice. It's like, I felt like I was already sort of equipped when I first sat down to begin that just from the lived uh, dynamism of the self-forming in collaboration with strangers, you know? Someday I want to know more about how safety came up in that context. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that actual safety exists. I'm not yeah. sure that I'm not sure that actual safety exists. I don't mean to be. Yeah. You know, I don't. Me either I don't. Right. Think it I'm exists. just. I'm not really. I'm not sure. It's an interesting <laughs> thing that came out there. That one day I hope you you push further. Thanks. Can I ask one question? Um, if all right, you you can all right. In some of the poems. Yeah, of course. It's like that long one. Where is it? Is this the, yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, a sample opening from the longer bus 
from um, Casa to Agadir. Mm -hmm. um, some of the poems in this book, unlike in the first, there are these like long lines that sort of stand on their own. They're organized into stanzas, right? But then the stanzas are like double spaced. Mm -hmm. And I just found it so potent that this was almost like enacting the sense of like self-faceting, mm -hmm. self-alienation, self-faceting, like to have that much space around each line on the page. But it also, and this could just be personal, seemed to happen a lot in the most painful poems. Mm. And so there's this affective component to that blank space where it wasn't just structurally enacting, it was also like emotionally fraught. What do you think of that? Sorry, I didn't mm. phrase that as a question at all. No, I, re I really appreciate that observation. And I want to go back to the book and think about the form through that that lens. I think the the long poem for me, really putting that together, mm. you know, as I mentioned in the brief preface of that poem, I, I, I really wasn't thinking about making a poem out of that experience. As I was inside that experience, I was thinking about survival. I was thinking spiritually, emotionally. I was using the available tools in life um, to pro to anchor myself to this earth, you know, and to process the experience. And, you know, language is one of the tools through which I, I process experience and questions and not poetry, you know, um, importantly, not poetry, mm -hmm. you know, I, that was not, that was not in my consciousness. And so when I looked at all of these notebooks after I arrived in California and I, said, well, I, I guess I should try to make something, you know, I, I should try to put something out in the world about what I've just survived. It's so layered and rich. And um, it became kind of like a, a collage exercise almost mm. because there were, it could have been a, a book length poem and there was enough material for that to be so. And I came to see in the making of the poem that while it could be, it didn't need to be, you know, that it, it had, I think in this iteration, all of its essential components and qualities, but it really was like, you know, just a page of prose. And then there would be four lines on the prose where I was like, oh, that's there together. That's a unit. And then they would be a little family, <sighs> you know, in the collaging and, you know, thinking about na narrative linear linearity within narrative chronology, like, how to enter do we enter at the accident do we enter in the hospital do we enter in new york before right thinking about all that so it just and there were many iterations and um and then the white space became the way to preserve like the subunits that i was pulling out of like the prose you know it's like an and, archaeological clue yeah, yeah oh i love that because that probably has special meaning for you <laughs> <laughs> i love that it's intended as a copy <laughs> but they no, no no i received it as such i received it as such yes thank you thank you um but that that was how that came to be you know and uh yeah, that was how that came to be. Cool. I mean, I could sit here and just do like so much homage to like being queer mixed race, like the, on the content level. That's right. like, I would just gush next, but maybe people here also want to, if we have time. Do you all have yeah. questions? Yeah. How are you all doing? Okay. Hello. In the midst of this great story that you're telling, there is a line that comes down that, and excuse me if I'm wrong. You know, missed for it. There's, I don't want history in the crime, I just want a dog. Mm -hmm. And I got this sense of like exhaustion mm -hmm. around always having to talk about identities. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a sense of pressure because of your identity to have to talk about these social issues that always come up? There's a line in a poem. Yeah, thank you for that question. The short answer is yes. And here's the long answer um, there is a line in a poem that I didn't read. It's the final, the final poem in the book. It's called Worthiness. And Towards the end of that poem, there's a line, I am tired of apologizing for the heaviness of what I am required to discuss in order mm -hmm. to live, right? That's that's how I, that is truly how I feel, right? That in order to exist in the social world, because of the intersecting identities that I was born into, it requires, it often requires, I try to live in a space after this, where if an individual has questions, it's it's their responsibility to kind of figure it out, right? Like, 
Black and Arab intersectional identities, you know, mixed race embodiment, um, different phenotypic presentations, right? Like each of us as an individual can look at those subjects and try to educate ourselves. And I, tr I try to live in a way where I am not having to justify my existence or justify why I'm putting myself in this room or explain the histories that actually mean it's X and not Y, but <laughs> more often than not, I, I, I have to, mm -hmm. you know? And so there is a spiritual, or I am made to have to, right? Um, and the alternative is, or can be, uh, a kind of social isolation that doesn't really feel like an alternative, right? So, you know, so so yeah, I, I often feel uh, spiritually, or I have often felt spiritually exhausted um, at the asterisk after certain identities. It's mm -hmm. like, he's this, but we have to qualify it. We have to explain it, right? Yeah, so yes. <laughs> yes yes yeah hello in your multiple of your poems you talk about psychotherapy uh, uh -huh. mental health yep uh, i've often heard writers poets from many different backgrounds and places different with different notions of what poetry is mm -hmm. describe poetry as a form of therapy and mm -hmm. coping is dealing with hard yes. mentality. But the question I want to ask you is sort of the inverse of that. Mm -hmm. um, having spent some time in a psychotherapeutic context, do you think that therapy can be poetry? I love that question. Uh, I I think I think therapy I think of therapy as an art form in the way that I think of poetry as an art form. I think therapy is therapy and poetry is poetry and poetry is not therapy. Mm -hmm. That's my position on that. And if someone needs help and support, they should find the help and support that they need. Poetry and a practice of writing poetry can facilitate uh, processes that are therapeutic towards self-comprehension and growing self growing self-possession, increasing consciousness around the questions and experiences of one's early life, the questions and experiences that are central to one's experience and uh, formation, self-concept, developmentally, um, but that it's important to recognize the ways in which they are distinct. I think it follows that if uh, poetry can have therapeutic value, therapy can have poetic value. And what I have found in my life is that the process of healing and self-inquiry that has taken place in offices that are dedicated to that kind of work has enhanced my poetic practice because it's given me access to parts of myself that I didn't otherwise have, that I wouldn't have otherwise had, right? So I think there's a, a mutually beneficial relationship that they, for some people, are interdependent um, but that they they are separate and distinct. Am I answering the question? I think so. Yep, great, <laughs> good. Those are some of my thoughts about poetry and therapy and the relationship. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Sort of flipping off there. You said, obviously you're working very like, personal mm -hmm. your own life, and, um, but you said earlier that it wasn't, someone described it as uh, mm -hmm. or someone said it was confessional and needed. So my question is, is because it's so personal and you're dealing with this, so obviously poetry is more than that. How do you balance self-expression versus like telling these broader messages? Yeah, I think that's a really, yeah, I think that's a really important question, and I appreciate that question. You know, I, I think the process for me of making poems begins with an engagement, as I was describing my experience of putting the long poem together with an engagement with language. And I'm not really thinking about poems. I'm thinking about the questions, the memory, the experience, you know, what's agitated me, what's enlivened me, where there's some kernel of something that I want to try to get closer to, that I want to understand a little more clearly, a little more deeply. And I put language on it. I try to put language on it. I put language around it. You know, and then I close the Word document and don't open it for six months, you know, and then I look back at it and see what's there. And then I bring the inquiry a little further along. And 
you know, that process for me can sometimes take years, you know, and I promise you that I'm not really thinking about making a poem until very late in that process. Mm. And so I, I wouldn't say that up until that moment, it's self-expression. It's more about inquiry that could be self-oriented or of the world, of social categories, of shared human conditions. But there's something that is personally uh, bringing me to to those inquiries. And then at some point, poetic craft <laughs> comes into that engagement. And the paragraph that I've been looking at for 18 months is broken into two stanzas. And then it's in seven stanzas. And then it's in tercets when I realized that actually there's a lover, a mother, and a speaker here as the three central figures. There's a poem called Inner Children, which is a five-page poem in these short line tercets. And the form of that, that was like a two-page mess of prose for about two years. And then the form came in when I realized that actually like the operative element or one of the dynamics that was really at the foundation of the whole experience of going to Morocco and uh, was this triangulation between these three figures and that sort of asserted a form and then the poem rose. Uh, so of course I'm writing autobiographically, like of course, you know, I, I'm writing out of my experience. I think confessional for me brings a lot of baggage that I actually don't really feel applies to my experience. And I and I also, and I, I would love to think about this maybe outside of this context, you know, in more intimate conversation about the application of that term to contemporary poetics and to the, mm. uh, uh, to, to poets of color and queer poets. And it was very, in its origin and its obsession, in its inception, connected to the work of Western European extracted white American poets Bourgeois. right it's like <laughs> class and race right and so I'm not anyway we could we could talk about that but um did I answer the question about the yeah okay and I also I want to say too just about the reason why I'm making th these poems there's there's a a selfish motivation initially I'm trying to understand something but I don't need to put any of it out in the world mm. I don't need to come here and give my heart and soul to a room of strangers about this traumatic event that I survived in Morocco. I don't need to do that. Like, I do that actually less for myself and more for the people who might receive that and be changed by that. You know, ideally, that would be my hope, right? That some some alchemical process could happen or maybe has happened in this room whereby we have received and changed one another. And that to me is a thing worth doing, even if it isn't the initial impulse behind the things that become poems, the inquiries that become poems. And shame, which I think is attached to confessionalism in problematic ways, has nothing to do with my experience. For me. <laughs> so, any other questions? Jennifer, I want to thank you for the thoughtful introduction. Sharif, thank you for the wonderful reading tonight. Thank you. And thank you both for the insightful conversation that followed. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We have some books for sale. Plus, we'll be signing books. If everyone could please just move your chairs to the next one of the wall. That would be grateful. Thanks. So I just... um. Do you want me to just, do I just stay here? Somebody wants to sign a little, okay. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it.